Thank you, thank you. It's very gratifying to be here today. As Nick was saying, I've always found that uh, poetry and mathematics are two things that are often very imposing and intimidating and perplexing to many people. So if I can get a quick show of hands, how many of you uh, are imposed or intimidated by mathematics? I can't quite see you all here. Okay, that's gonna be a big number, I think. How about, uh, how about poetry? How many of you have always found poetry just a little abstract, perhaps uh, perplexing in some way? Okay, so why not bring the two together and see what happens? Um, these are two things that are very terrifying, and what I hope to do in the next 15 minutes or so is convince you all that they don't have to be terrifying at all, and that when you bring them together, you start to highlight some of the many ways in which the, uh, both of these enterprises, poetry and mathematics, uh, have a very creative element to them. Obviously, we think of poetry as being creative, but there is a lot of creativity inherent in mathematics as well. The topic I'm going to be talking about primarily is that of constraint. Constraint, thinking in terms of binding or confining. You know, you, you think if you're constraining or if you are constrained by something, you are somehow bound in some fashion. You, your movement is restricted. You don't have quite as much flexibility as you might like to have. But constraint can be freeing. And the constraint that I'm going to be talking about is literary constraint and the sort of freedom that, that it can give to the author. Constraint is something that's been present in literature throughout all time, um, in particular in poetry. Uh, how many of you have heard of sonnets? Show of hands, sonnets, haiku perhaps, haiku? What about haiku? What's, what's the structure of a haiku? Do you all remember what that is? Five, seven, five, yeah, in fact, five, seven, five. That's the traditional haiku is, a, is five syllables in the first line, seven in the second line, and then five in the final line. Sonnets have 14 lines with a particular rhyme, sc rhyme scheme, depending on whether, which, which tradition of sonnet you're talking about. But uh, each of these forms has a particular constraint to it. Um, that, that, that constraint limits what the author can do. You're not really writing a sonnet if you're not writing in 14 lines and you follow a certain rhyme scheme. Of course, there are ways to work within that constraint, and it's the, uh, the freedom that comes from the constraint uh, is, is the sort that uh, it sort of limits what you can say, and it gives you a, a, a less broad range of words from which to choose. If I handed you a dictionary with two million words in it, and there are such dictionaries, and I said, here, write a poem using the words in this dictionary. Many of us would be very intimidated at first because whew, that's a lot of words. We don't want to have to write a poem using, with that much freedom. But if I handed you a, a dictionary with perhaps mm, a thousand words in it, if I handed you a dictionary that had only the words in it which can be written using the letters in your first name, that might be a lot easier to choose. You might have a list of two or 300 words. And that sort of constraint gives you a lot of liberation. It helps you to recognize things you might not have understood before. This was something that was recognized in the 1960s, actually early in uh, the 60s. In November of 1960, a group of French intellectuals, mostly writers, but a few mathematicians, under the leadership of Raymond Canon and Francois Le Leonet, Gathered together in your typical Parisian fashion, they gathered together in a coffee house. I'm not kidding, they did. They gathered together and they, they sat down uh, and, and uh, invented some rules by which they would invent constrained poetry or constrained literature. The name of the group they founded was ULIPO, which is a French acronym for Ouvoir de Literature Potentielle, which means very roughly speaking, Workshop for Potential Literature. Literature we understand, maybe workshop we understand, like they're going to be crafting things, they're going to be working things out. The word potential is a little more elusive. And essentially what they were doing is they weren't creating literature. They were creating means by which to create literature. Specifically, they were creating constraints. The goal of the folks in Ulipo was to invent new ways to bind the author, to constrain and therefore limit the ways in which the author could construct new works. They considered their enterprise one of creating these constraints and not so much the works that were bound by those constraints. So whereas most authors would be concerned with creating a masterpiece novel, the folks in Uli Poe were more concerned with creating the constraint by which a novel could be created. They weren't so concerned with actually writing the novel after the constraint was developed. They were concerned with the constraint itself. Now there are whole books written on Ulipo. There are, there are, uh, there are 
uh, treatises, collections of their manifestos and their philosophies. There are collections of their constraints that they developed and maybe some examples of those constraints. And there are, in fact, works of poetry and whole novels that have been written according to these constraints. So you can go on reading and studying about this stuff for hours and hours and hours, or days and days and days. In fact, I'm teaching a course on this right now at UNCA. But the, uh, to give you a sort of sense as to uh, what one of the Ulipian constraints might look like, I'm going to give you an example today, and that's called the N plus seven algorithm. It's one that sort of highlights the mathematical nature of a lot of the constraints that the Ulipians worked with. The M plus seven algorithm works as follows. You start with a work of literature that already exists, and today I'm going to work with a very short poem by Emily Dickinson. You start with a work of uh, literature that already exists, and then you pick out a dictionary. Any dictionary will do. I'm actually going to apply a couple of different dictionaries, and, and you'll see what the result is. You take your dictionary, and you take your piece of literature, and Word by word, line by line, you go through the piece that you have in front of you, and any time you see a noun, you look that noun up in the dictionary. So you go to your dictionary, and you see, okay, you see the word, you know, cat. And then you count seven nouns after the word cat in that dictionary. So, you know, you go cat, catalysis, catastrophe, whatever. You go through, and eventually you get to whatever, whatever the seventh noun after cat is. You go back to your piece that you started with, and where you had cat before, you take it out and you put in the new word. And you do that, you keep doing that for every noun that you see. It's called N plus seven because N represents the position in the dictionary of whatever word you started with and then you do plus seven. You, you go seven nouns past that point and you see what results. Now this, this almost doesn't seem like literature, right? It seems almost random in a sense, but it's not because the dictionary is there already. There's no randomosity involved. The dictionary is there already. The piece of literature is there already. You've got this simple mathematical procedure, this preset procedure for developing a new piece of literature. So one complaint levied against the, uh, the Uli Ulipo people was that they were just, bleh, just randomly creating literature, and they very strongly resisted that. Another complaint was that they weren't being creative. Where's the creativity in this? But the creativity is, uh, arises from the choice that the author has in taking the original text. You choose the original text to work with. And you can also choose the dictionary. Because if the, two diction if the dictionary you choose uh, has certain properties, it's going to create a wildly different piece of literature than the one you started with. In particular, if you have a very large dictionary, one that's really robust and has a lot of uh, words in it, chances are you're not going to go very far when you count seven nouns forward. But if you have a little tiny dictionary, you might take huge leaps in the alphabet before you get to the spot where you do your noun replacement. So the poem I'm going to uh, read to you to start with is, as I said, it's a short poem by Emily Dickinson. Uh, Dickinson fans, are there any Dickinson fans in the room? A few? Okay. Yeah. All right. She's one of my favorite poets because she was uh, wildly creative. She was very much ahead of her time. Some of the imagery she used, her, 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 sense, of, her sense of place, her, sense of her, her tone was, was very much out of time and out of place. I, I consider her very forward thinking. And for the purpose of this exercise, uh, uh, it, was, it was nice to use a Dickinson poem because many of her poems are very short and they get right to the point and you can see the meaning right away. The poem I will use uh, begins with the line, the pedigree of honey. The pedigree of honey does not concern the bee. A clover, any time to him, is aristocracy. And you can see sort of the theme of the poem that we, you know, you don't have to have riches in order to be happy with what you have. Um, let's take the uh, M plus seven algorithm and apply it to that poem using first Webster's Ninth New Collegiate Dictionary. Now, are there any dictionary nerds here? Any, anyone, <laughs> seriously, anyone who loves lexicography? Woo! Words? Yay, words? Does anyone know the, the there, there's actually, and there was a piece on this not long ago in the New York Times, uh, because I think it was the 50th anniversary of the release of the Ninth New Collegiate, or the 40th anniversary or something like that. Uh, not the, the Ninth New Collegiate Dictionary by Webster was uh, controversial. Controversial because it was, if I recall, the first dictionary to include ain't as a word and as in proper usage, and people were horrified because how dare you use ain't in a dictionary? That's not a proper word. That shouldn't be in the dictionary. 
So ain't was included in the dictionary by this one. Um, if you take Webster's Ninth New Collegiate Dictionary and you apply it to a pedigree of honey, what you get is the pedophile of honey guide does not concern the bee eater. A clubber, any time to him, is armadillo. <laughs> okay, so kind of strange, but you notice bee, bee eater, you didn't go too far between those two, and honey, honey guide, because there are so many phrases and words that, that start with bee or start with honey that you actually don't make it too far through the dictionary before you hit the seventh noun. So I thought, well, that's not really fun. Let's, let's, let's take a smaller dictionary. Let's take one with a fewer words to it. So I did a little online search, and I found, um, a, you know, thinking along the lines of bees, I thought, entomology, the study of insects. Let's, let's theme it a little bit. So I found this gentleman in Australia named Graham Cock has online, he's got a dictionary of entomological terms. So all told, maybe the dictionary has 1,000 words in it. So it's, it's fairly sparse. Webster's Ninth New Collegiate has 250,000 words in it. So we're talking orders of magnitude larger. If you take Graham Cock's little uh, entomological dictionary and you apply the M plus seven algorithm to the pedigree of honey, it does not concern the bee, a clover any time to him, is aristocracy, so you can get through it really quickly. You get uh, the fragma of hypoplural bursacs does not concern the bursal copa coplatrix. A comb any time to him is basal piece. So you get a lot more technical terminology, of course, but you also, you might have noticed in that last one, aristocracy became basal piece. You went from the A's to the B's because in trying to find the seventh noun following uh, aristocracy, you actually have to leap through into the next letter to find the next one. And you can choose even smaller dictionaries. There are online dictionaries with only 100, 200 words, and then you're just flying willy-nilly through the dictionary. Now, of course, you don't have to choose seven. This is another element that you can use, the, the, another tool in the creative toolbox that the author has applying the M plus seven algorithm. Again, and this is just one of hundreds of different constraints that the Olympians invented. And I've done a little research myself and invented some, some of my own constraints based on these. But the M plus seven algorithm, why not make it the M plus eight algorithm or the M plus nine algorithm? Why not, in fact, just throw the dictionary out the window and do some other sort of replacement for nouns that's sort of you know, along the same lines. So I decided one day, about two or three years ago, to sit down, and instead of taking the dictionary, I'll take the pedigree of honey again, you know, why not, it's fun. We'll work with Dickinson again. And instead of the dictionary, I picked up a copy of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Right? How many people have read Frankenstein? Oh, good, I'm, I'm, I'm pleasantly surprised by that, yeah. Uh, you know, that's a, you know, everyone's seen the movie, or if they haven't seen the movie, at least uh, they know the, the whole meme, but maybe they haven't read the book. I'm, ha I'm pleasant, pleasantly surprised that people have read this book. Um, of course, how many people remember what the first word starting with the letter P in Frankenstein is? No? Oh, okay. All right, so what we're gonna do is instead of, instead of using the dictionary to govern our replacements, what we'll do is we will, uh, each time we encounter a noun in Emily Dickinson, just like we were doing before, we will replace that noun with the noun in the same position, meaning first position, second position, whatever, like the first noun, first noun, second noun, second noun. The first noun in that position, starting with the same letter in Frankenstein. So the pedigree of honey we see pedigree, a noun, honey, a noun. We'll take pedigree and we'll replace it with the first word, or rather the first noun, starting with the letter P in Frankenstein. We'll take honey and we'll replace it with the first noun starting with the letter H in Frankenstein. I call this a translexical substitution. Right? We're, we're substituting, studying, substituting words between two, uh, two collections of lexemes, two, two collections of words. And what results, if you go through that poem using that process, it's a little arduous, it takes you about 20 minutes, you have to go through and find the first word starting with, and it, it takes a little while, but what you get is the pole of horizon does not concern the breeze. A commencement, any time to him, is agitation. <laughs> now, a number of you might have been right there with me for the first few lines. I was pleasantly surprised when I first wrote this poem, you know, I wrote this poem, 
you know, Mary Shelley and I sat down with Emily Dickinson and we wrote this poem together. I was pleasantly surprised when I first wrote this poem that it scanned really well, right? It doesn't make a whole lot of sense at first, right? But you try to impose sense on it. We tend to be forgiving when it comes to nonsensicality. We don't like to see things make no sense at all, and that's the point I'm going to end on in a moment. But, you know, I, I will make sense, I promise. It doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense, but at least it sounds good. And as you read it and the sound hits you and you start to appreciate the sound, you start to put meaning on it, the pole of horizon. It's like we're, we're looking off into the distance and on the horizon we see a pole. The pole of horizon does not concern the breeze. We feel a breeze blow past us from the pole, I don't know. Maybe there's a flag on the pole flapping in the breeze. The pole of horizon does not concern the breeze. A commencement, we're starting out. The commencement, any time to him. And so far, let me say that again, the pole of horizon does not concern the breeze. A commencement, any time to him, is agitation. <laughs> right? You're right there with me until that last line. It doesn't scan poorly. It flows, and you're putting meaning there, and all of a sudden you get to the end, agitation. And for a couple of years, I was very disappointed in this. And then I was going, and then I was, I was going to give a talk at, at some school. I've, I've, I've talked about this, this poem and, and Ulipo at a number of different uh, conferences, a number of different uh, schools. And I was going to give a talk about this, uh, this poem. And I read the poem again. It was right there in the middle of the talk when I realized, no, 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 no. It's perfect. The poem is perfect as it is because it scans so well at first. The pole of horizon does not concern the breeze. A commencement, any time to him, is agitation. And then that last word hits you. And how do you feel? For a moment, you feel discombobulated. You feel, how do you feel? agitated, you feel agitated. It shouldn't end like that. You hit that feeling, and the poem just, it hits you in the gut, you're agitated. And, and it, it took me two years to do it, but I finally imposed meaning on that poem. And that's really where I wanted to end this. I've just got a minute or so, and I wanted to wrap up by saying poetry, mathematics, the two of them sort of make sense together, but more importantly, I think they make sense as Meaning-making methods. Human beings are meaning-making machines. We don't like to be sort of floating around in a sea of meaninglessness. We like to think that we have purpose. We like to think that what we do means something. Whether we're mathematicians, whether we're poets, really what we're doing is we are trying to make sense of the world around us. Some of us do it through words and poetry. Some of us do it through numbers and formulas. We're really just trying to make sense of this world. And I think the work of Uli Poe is wonderful because it's a great way to show how those two ways of making sense can make sense together. Thank you. <laughs>